Good afternoon. Give me a second here. All right, so before I uh, get into these remarks and introduce myself, uh, I know today's topic is supposed to be about innovation and being innovative. And just to be contrarian, I'm going to be questioning innovation. I do go by Tommy. My uh, first name is actually Thomas. And uh, doubting Thomas, my whole life, teachers have always told me, you know, they like me as a student, but uh, I tend to ask too many questions. My wife can tell you the same. She's here today. Before we get going, I just want to say a big thank you, Nonprofit Institute, College of Southern Maryland, uh, all the people that have participated in this event. All the people who have helped make this conference possible are on the back of this pamphlet right here. I was going to go through all the names, but honestly, there are so many people helping out. I, it, it would take way too long. I do want to say thank you to the catering people in the back, uh, unsung heroes for these events. They always do a great job. So thank you, everybody. All right, so you guys heard that I have an interesting background. Uh, there's a lot of things that I've done, a lot of weird hobbies that I have. I will not go into all of those today. But in order for you guys to, I don't know, take me seriously, uh, hear what I'm actually saying, I do need to give you a little context about who I am. As you've already heard, I'm Tommy Luganbill. I am the director of the Entrepreneur and Innovation Institute here at the college. I'm also the program coordinator for business administration, and I have the pleasure of being a faculty member as well. I see a student that I used to have. It's very good to have you here. So in, in, in that right, um, two rules for, for when I'm speaking. Trust me, these will not be that bad. Rule number one, if you have to go to the bathroom, do not raise your hand. Just go. Rule number two is if you get a phone call, take it out in the hall. All right? You'd be surprised. People actually answer their phones during things like this. And uh, look, I know life happens, but just you're not, you're not going to make me embarrassed if you get up and leave. I know things, things happen. All right, so where am I from? My hometown is Rockville, Maryland. I was not born in Southern Maryland. I chose to live in Southern Maryland. Uh, right now, I live in Dunkirk with my wife, Allison. And she doesn't know this, but there's slides with her face on it. So she has that to look forward to. <laughs> but I am from Rockville. Uh, I have not gone very far in my life. Furthest I ever went was the University of Delaware as far as living. Uh, I got my undergrad there, degree in finance. Went on to Maryland to get an MBA a few years after that. And now uh, I do attend Florida Tech. Uh, one of my professors, Dr. Bob, is here. I appreciate him being here. And just to give you guys context on my experience with all of these different universities, I always say Delaware has my heart. It's my uh, alma mater, my one true love. University of Maryland took my money. <laughs> I love Maryland. I love Maryland, but very expensive. And then Florida Tech takes my time. Dr. Bob knows that. It's very hard uh, working on a doctor right now. Uh, not quite finished, but we're getting there. So as you can see, this is my wife, Allison, and I. Allison here in the front and our pony, Peaches. So I guess. Lesson number one, shameless promotion. I don't care what it is. And for me right now, I'm promoting Peach's Instagram account. <laughs> Shetland Peaches, for anyone that loves novelty animal accounts, please follow her. She's got 1,600 followers, I think, right now. Why did I do this? I don't know. I'm crazy, I guess. Also, I, I thought maybe this would be a good way to get sponsorships for the pony. Didn't work out that way, but we still have a good time. Another picture of Allison. Also our children. We've got General. He is he's a geriatric horse, as I like to call him. He likes to bite. He's 26 years old. But I love him nonetheless. And then the newest addition to the family is Ralph. She is a girl. It's a little bit of a conflict there. We didn't name her before we knew that she was a girl. And they don't have Instagram. Uh, not because I don't love them, but having a pony Instagram account is just too much time as it is. All right, so here's where I get to make my mother-in-law feel really embarrassed right now because she was supposed to be here today. So I was going to call her out and say, thank you for coming. This is her. This is Allison's mom. And then here's my mom as well. And uh, just for those of you out there, the reason that, uh, that I did want to call attention to her is because she does work for a nonprofit. It's called Barker Foundation. Uh, they do a lot of great stuff with uh, adoption uh, for children in, in the D.C. Bethesda area. All right. Enough about me and time to talk about you guys. Why are we here? Why are we here? So you've read the pamphlet. 
You know, there's this crazy guy that's supposed to talk about innovation, but really, why are we here? And I think for me to stand up here and try to tell all of you that I can solve your problems for being more innovative or coming up with a new strategy that's going to be the next best thing for your organization, uh, I think it's naive, and I also think it's a little bit arrogant. Okay, Who is this random person you've never met He's going to stand on stage for 20 minutes, and by the way, it won't be much longer than 20 minutes. Who is this random person that's trying to tell you exactly what to do to make your organization better? I can't do that. I cannot do that. But I can inspire you. I can tell you stories of other people just like you who have been innovative. And I can try to make you think. And I can try to make you ask questions. And that's really what I want to do. Uh, I want to make you ask questions. Oftentimes, people are looking for the solution. That's all they want. Especially nowadays, people just want to cut to the chase. OK, what's the quickest way to do it? How do we grow? Uh, how do we get more donors? You got to ask the right questions before you actually get the right answers. And when they asked me to do this presentation, I was kind of mulling around thinking, OK, how am I going to talk about innovation? Uh, what does that even mean? And I'll get to that later in the presentation. But what came to me was three questions that my yoga instructor always says. Because yes, don't I look like a yogi? This, this right here? I love yoga, by the way. Uh, it keeps me sane. And this instructor, she asks three questions at the beginning of every class. And very applicable to the practice of yoga, but also applicable to everyday life. And also, for, for this conversation, this conference in general, uh, helping you guys to be more innovative on your own. Because it's going to have to come from you. So question number one, how are you feeling today? Someone in this room is probably extremely tired. That would be me. My cat woke me up three times last night. <laughs> My wife's laughing because she wasn't there. Some of you are probably full. Some of you are probably really energized, feeling great, you made a great connection. And some of you guys are probably feeling pretty down. It's a good chance somebody in this room is having a very hard time right now. And the reason it's important to ask this question, whether it's at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, before you sit down to strategize, or anything for that matter, the reason it's important is because how you were feeling at that moment will actually dictate the way you think in terms of questions and the way that you come to conclusions. Now, it sounds a lot of, like I'm saying a lot of hippie stuff right now, but just stay with me. Because what I'm trying to tell you is how you are feeling at this exact moment is probably going to be a lot different three hours from now. Okay? So as you sit down to innovate or strategize, maybe you don't feel so good at that moment. Maybe you say to yourself, it's OK to walk away and come back when you are feeling a little bit more up to it. Question number two, where are you? All right, you're all physically sitting in La Plata right now, right? Everybody can agree? OK, all right, good. This question is a little bit more rhetorical, OK? Where are you in your head? All right, are you thinking, when is this person going to stop speaking? I have no clue what he's talking about. I've got to pick up my kids from daycare after this. I've got a relative who's sick that I've got to go visit in the hospital. Where's your head? Are you actually physically and mentally in this room at this conference right now? I guess that was a speaker. So think about that. Think about that, because that also affects how you come to innovative <laughs> solutions. Sorry, guys. Question number three, what do you need? Again. This changes depending on the time of day, the day of the week. It's never the same thing. Now, for me right now, I want everybody to do me a favor and think about what you need from this speech and from this conference. Okay? Because statistically speaking, you're probably only going to remember about 20% of what I say, if that. So if you're only going to remember 20% of what I say, at least try to figure out what you need from, from listening to this person speak right now on stage 
And then as I'm speaking, you can, you can hone in and say, oh, OK, that, that fits exactly what I need. And all the other stuff I say about my cat and my dog and my, my horse, it can all go away. OK, so just try to think about what you need. Most importantly, trust your own truth. This can be interpreted a million different ways. And really what I'm trying to say here is if you ask yourself those questions, and you don't have to have answers to all those questions, but if you actually ask yourself those questions, please realize that the answer that comes to you is probably the best answer you're going to get. There's nothing I'm going to tell you today, nothing that anybody else running these panels are going to tell you today that you haven't already heard or that you didn't already know really deep down in your heart. Because you are the ones running your organizations. You actually know what works. So that's what I'm going to do. If you can't see this, it's kind of weird and fuzzy right now, but it's just a reminder. Okay? I'm just here to remind you guys that you already know the answers to a lot of these things. And I want you to see other people, some local and some from far away, that trusted their own intuition, trusted what they knew, and made a difference. Even though I'm questioning innovation and we're asking all these questions, I do need to talk about innovation, or the word innovate. So what does innovate actually mean? I was at a session earlier. Uh, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, I'm not going to call her out, but the young lady said something along the lines of, well, everybody wants to make their logos innovative or have them innovate. And it's kind of the new thing. And I would agree. I would agree. I think a lot of people, a lot of people don't really know what this means. But strictly from a definition standpoint, innovate gets confused with invention all the time. Innovate and invention get confused all the time. They're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. An invention is when you create something out of nothing. An innovation, or to innovate, is when you take something that already exists, you change it, and you create value that wasn't there. So if both those definitions sound confusing, the best example I can give you is the telephone was an invention. The iPhone was an innovation. Or even just the cell phone was an innovation. Because the telephone already existed. All you did was you made it so that there wasn't a cord attached to it. And you could carry it anywhere you wanted. That's an innovation. That's not an invention. When people sit down to innovate, I think what they do, actually I know what they do, they have to pump themselves up to invent something. And the reality is inventing things is really hard. It is super hard to invent something. You have to be a very left brain and right brain person. You have to have the creativity to think of something. And then you have to have the other side of the brain to actually make it. So inventing is super difficult. I'm not saying innovating is any, eh, it's a little bit easier, but not much easier. But what I'm saying is for people who maybe aren't the inventor types, you can innovate. All you're doing is you're taking something that already exists and changing it. So I think this is the hometown hero, so everyone's going to like this story. So this is Brian Jordan. Brian and his wife, Donna, who I don't think are here, but I met them at this conference three years ago and very quickly sparked a, a friendship that has been wonderful, mostly because of the positive energy that I think they bring to this whole idea of, of innovation and even just business itself. So Brian, what he's doing right in this picture, this is, this is a different innovation that I'm not touching on, but Brian's an inventor. Okay? He's an inventor, but he's also an innovator. Now, he's, he's fortunate enough to be good at both. So he's the co-founder of Jordan R&D. Um, Brian's first product was, for anyone who, who remembers this toy, uh, it was real popular about 10 years ago. You would pull it back and shoot puffs of air across the room. It was a very popular Christmas gift. That's how Brian first got into this whole idea. So recently, I guess in the last six months, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, Brian and his wife saw a big problem with coastal flooding. Uh, hurricanes have been getting worse and worse. Um, you know, not going to get into why or, or, you know, people have different reasons for, for why they think that's happening. The reality is, is that it's happening. So seawater sea is rising, hurricanes are happening, 
more and more people are losing their homes or getting stranded. So Brian, with the help of the Small Business Development Center, by the way, he works with SBDC, so they're a resource for all of you as well. Brian, sitting in his house, I'm making this story up, by the way, so just go with me. Brian's just sitting in his house one day, and he sees a bookcase, and boom, a light bulb goes off. The reason I'm making this up is because that's never how it happens. But Brian's sitting in his house one day, and he sees a bookcase. And then he goes, wait a second, that kind of looks like something. So he starts to do some designs, and he goes, okay, I've got a bookcase. Most people have bookcases. Starts to look at the shelves. You know, that kind of looks like something. And then, he, and then he goes, oh, there's some space in the bottom of this bookcase. You know, maybe I can store some stuff down there. He turns the bookcase into a life raft. The bookcase is a lifeboat. When I heard this, I thought it was genius. It's amazing. He takes the shelves, and you, all you do is you flip them, and they become seats. And I'm pretty sure, I don't, want, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure you can fit at least a few hundred pounds in these things. Now, Brian knows this. He's a big guy. He's a former football player. All right? So, so when I say he's a big guy, he's a very big guy. Okay? He, right here, is rowing himself to safety. Let's hope this never actually happens to him. But this all came from this. He, was, he, he just had this idea, okay, what do I do with the bookcase? I can turn it into a lifeboat. And so the oar that you see, um, I know he has different designs. I think one of his designs has the oar on the back. And for this one, it looks like he has it stored in the bottom. But he's a hometown hero, and he's someone that innovates. So here's another story, another local person, relatively local. I have a friend, Shazi Khan. She's uh, from Vienna, Virginia. So Shazia, back in, I believe, 2009, uh, she decides to start something called Eco Energy. And Shazi is a Pakistani American, um, educated here in the US, uh, a lawyer, civil rights lawyer. And she starts to realize that there's a huge problem in Pakistan. The problem in Pakistan is the power grid is extremely unreliable. Now, for obvious reasons, not having electricity is a big deal. But in Pakistan, especially rural Pakistan, this was a huge problem. Why was this a problem? Because women in Pakistan are expected to raise their children while their husbands go off to work during the day. Now, a lot of these families still aren't earning enough money to cover the basic needs. So a lot of times, the women of the household have to also have a job that they do at nighttime. So they either have to walk places in the dark which leads to violence and, and sexual uh, misconduct, or they run their business out of their house with lighting that's brought to them via kerosene lamps or sometimes these special concoctions that are made of really toxic chemicals. So they light these lamps, kerosene's burning, they work through the night because they can't work during the day. You know, the husband's allowed to go out to work, they're not allowed to go out to work, they make beads, they make clothing. That's how they support their family. Now what happens, what happens when they do this? Well, a lot of times their children, sometimes they get asthma, sometimes they get emphysema, and sometimes they burn their houses down. This is a terrible problem that still exists. So Shazia says, okay, what am I gonna do? As she's getting going, coming up with this, this solution to the problem, it gets even worse. Right about six months after she comes up with this idea, there's a massive flood in Pakistan. This is in 2010. Then even more people lose electricity. Even more women are just devastated by this because they have to work through the night without any lighting. So she says, okay, I'll do my part. She goes out and she says, I got a solution. I got a solution. I'm gonna come up with $24,000 and I'm gonna donate 1,000 solar lanterns. Now this is great. This is extremely noble. And Shazi would not think anything less of me for saying this. But this was never going to work long term. It just wasn't. Again, great thing that she did. But what she realized was people sometimes, uh, they don't understand why people want to donate things. She got stuck at the border trying to bring all these things in. They did not want to accept $24,000 worth of donated lanterns. She was essentially asked for a bribe to donate things. 
literally right after a massive flood. So this wasn't going to work long term. She got the lanterns in, but she realized this isn't going to work. This is her, all right? This is her in Pakistan. And this is an example of some of the things that she donated. It's a solar uh, tower right there with a little uh, PV unit on top. And yes, this is exactly what it looks like. So Shazia realizes I can't bribe people every time I donate things. How can I make things different? So this is really, this is, this is actually where she innovated. All right, donating was amazing, but this is actually where she innovated. She reorganized the business or nonprofit and she built a whole distribution network. So instead of just donating solar lanterns, she now has this whole network of small little micro entrepreneurs who run shops selling solar lanterns. So Shazia has the whole supply chain lined up. She, you know, she makes a little bit of money each way. That's, that's what helps run the organization. And then at the end of the last mile, there's entrepreneurs just like this one pictured here who sell the lanterns. And now they sell way more than that. They have about 500 different products. All of them are solar powered. Fans, um, you, you name it. So what is my lesson from these two people? They are people who ask for help. Now, I didn't give you an example of Brian asking for help, but trust me, he does. Because he's a humble person and he knows when to ask for help. Shazia, 100% asked for help when she was stuck getting forced to pay bribes to donate things she said, I don't know how to go from here. It was her asking for help that gave her the idea to reorganize and start this distribution network. And that's what she did. So asking for help, why is it so hard? Here's my theory. When you ask for help, for whatever reason, the way that our brains and the way that we've been raised, when you ask for help, you, you, you show a sign of weakness. That's, this is my personal opinion. When you ask for help, people think you are showing weakness. And what does that mean? So if I'm a nonprofit, if I'm asking people for help, I'm scared my donors are hearing about it, maybe my board, maybe the people who work for me. I'm nervous. People go, oh, why are they asking for help? That's weird. Why can't they just figure it out? They, you know, they're supposed to be the one running this organization. I don't think that that's a good way to think. I don't believe this anymore. This is how I used to think. I've changed. But what I see is that for the most part, a lot of people are still stuck here. People are too worried to ask for help and it needs to happen because innovation itself requires collaboration. And the only way to collaborate is by asking for somebody to help. They're not just one day gonna start collaborating. I mean, maybe, maybe you bump into somebody and you, know, you bump into them at lunch today and you just, boom, you hit it off. But chances are, you're going to have to pick up the phone. You're going to have to email somebody, send a message to them, however you do it. And you're going to have to say, I need help. And that's going to lead to collaboration. Now, here's my last story, I promise. This whole idea of collaboration, all right, is it just, some, is it just something that you hear? Is it, like, is it like I heard earlier? Is it just like innovation where, yeah, it's real trendy to say this, or yeah, let's collaborate. I hear that all the time. Or, or is it real, OK? And I believe it is. So this is an actual question to you guys. Has anyone actually heard of Confinity before? OK. If you had, I'd be surprised, because I had to look this up. <laughs> Confinity was one of the first online banks back in 1998. Yeah, they were way ahead of their time. Now, this guy. Peter Thiel, who some of you might have heard of, not, not that common you know, household name, but some of you might have heard of him. He started Confinity. Now remember, this is 1998. He starts an online banking company. At the time, this is the height of the dot-com bubble. He's doing real well. He's raising a ton of money. But you'll, you'll hear this in a second. He's very smart. He's a very smart person. And what he realized was that this whole dot-com boom was coming to an end. It was coming to an end. A lot of the people that funded him to get going, 
a lot of the banks, VCs, private investors, they, they weren't returning phone calls as quickly anymore. And it was getting harder and harder to get, to get cash when they needed to grow. This company was starting to struggle, starting to struggle, all right? Now this is still when everybody in, on Wall Street is thinking things are great. So what does he do? He asked for help. Now, maybe he was forced to ask for help, maybe he came up with it on his own. The point is, is he still asked for help. Who did he go to? He goes to x.com. X.com, which by the way, it's completely changed now. It's a video game uh, company now. But at the time, x.com was, again, also one of the first online banking payment systems. All right? So Mr. Thiel calls x.com. This is his biggest rival. They're both in Silicon Valley. Pretty much they hate each other. They're, they're, the, they're probably the reason that the other one needs to be raising money because they're eating each other's market share. And so who did he actually call? He called Elon Musk. You all probably know who Elon Musk is. But before he was Mr. Tesla, and before he was Solar City, and before he was SpaceX, and the crazy guy on YouTube that does podcasts, before he was that person, he was the founder of X.com. And Mr. Thiel and Mr. Musk did not like each other. All right? Maybe there's a whole bunch more to this story, but this is the legend. Now, because Mr. Thiel was able to swallow his pride and say, I really need help, he called his biggest rival, two of these guys come together and start PayPal. Now, how did it all go down? If you're really interested, X.com technically purchased Confinity, but what happened was both gentlemen became co-founders. All right, and we all know how they did after that. eBay came in a few years later. They got a fat paycheck. They ran the company for a few years and they went on and did whatever they wanted. So in this same thread of asking for help and collaborating and innovating, because remember, they were both doing the same thing, they just changed it a little bit, there's this thing called PayPal Mafia, which is born. All right, some of you might have heard of this. Uh, I love the PayPal Mafia because, because it shows that you can work together with people, especially people who are probably all super type A personalities that are always fighting for the same resources. PayPal Mafia came from Mr. Thiel and Mr. Musk working together. Now, some of these companies you haven't heard of, but a lot of them you have. These are companies that came out of PayPal. YouTube, Yelp, LinkedIn, Tesla, Square. I'm sure most of you have heard of these. Some of them you haven't, but I promise you they are gigantic successes. And they all have to do with Mr. Thiel saying, I need help, and people working together. People with huge egos. All right. <laughs> so I'm a huge hypocrite, among other things. But as I was uh, thinking about what I actually wanted to say today, um, I, had, I had about a month or so, I think, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, I, I, I really got stuck with that, that same comment that the young lady made earlier. I was like, what, what, what do you mean by innovation? What is, like, what is that? And I kept going back and forth about what I wanted to say. And I realized, if you're, gonna, if you're always telling people to ask for help, then why are, you, why are you gonna sit here and come up with this thing and not ask other people to help you? All right, so I was a hypocrite. I did something that I've never, never really done before. I went online, went to all my social media platforms, and I, this is just a paraphrase, but essentially what I did, in summary, is I said, I'm gonna be giving this speech. Is there anybody out there who wants to give advice to nonprofits? Same question on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And I got a ton of responses from people that I didn't even know I was still friends with, you know? <laughs> like my cousin, my cousin and my aunt and people that I don't, you know. It was crazy. People that you would never expect. And they all had great advice. And I'm not gonna go through everything that they said, but I have, I have collected all the different things that came in. It's probably about 20 different unique pieces of advice. And I'm gonna give them to the Nonprofit Institute. And I ho hopefully some of you actually uh, reach out and, and say, okay, well, can I take a look at what those things were? Because these are 20 pieces of unique advice from non-biased individuals who all were answering the question, how do nonprofits innovate? And some of the answers will blow you away. 
I got one answer that was, no joke, three pages long in an email. Yeah. These are, there's people who really care. There's people that you will never meet ever in your life, and they still care about what you're doing. And this is, this is really coming back to asking the question and saying, I don't know, I need help. Can you help me? So full circle, I'm going to ask these questions again. How are you feeling today? Maybe it's changed, hopefully. I don't know. Where are you? Maybe you're full now, so now you're, now you're not thinking about food anymore. Maybe you're actually listening now. And what do you need? What do you need? Um, hopefully I've answered some of your questions, or hopefully I've given you the tools to ask the right questions. But if there's anything you remember after I'm done speaking here, try to think about what you need. Because it's 1245 right now. I think we got another three hours to go here, about, right? So you have another three hours to try and take home what you actually need. So I really appreciate you guys giving, my attention, giving, giving your attention to me. What I would hope and I would love for you to do now is to just network and try to answer these questions on your own. Because some guy talking for 30 minutes isn't going to solve all your problems. You're going to have to solve your own problems but there are people here to help you do that. That's it. So I want to say thank you, and I appreciate your time.